save treats for special occasions, and get up and play an hour each day. Be our guest to healthy living and visit letsmove.gov to learn more. That's letsmove.gov. This message has been brought to you by Let's Move, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Ad Council. Turn on all your lights, lock the doors, and pull down the shades. Spooky South Coast is back. All right, welcome back to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with the silent assassin, Matt Costa, science advisor, Matt Moniz. And joining us on the phone now is Wayne Ibn Musa Barbosa, the vice president of Parting Ways. And uh, you can check out their website while we talk, partingways.org. They're also on Facebook and on Twitter. And uh, you can find out all the information about Parting Ways, the organization, what they do, the site, what they're trying to preserve. Uh, but we're going to talk with Mr. Barbosa now about all that. Good evening, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Thank you. I, I first learned about Parting Ways through Jack Blaine's column in last Sunday Standard Times, and I have to apologize for that being the first time that I've ever heard of it. I, actually, as I mentioned before, growing up in Plymouth, uh, and I went to Plymouth Public Schools in my elementary years, and I don't ever remember hearing about it from any of my teachers. Well, that, that's not something surprising to me, because uh, Parting Ways is one of the nation's biggest secrets uh, it connects to uh, the founding fathers. Uh, I think you know by uh, the little research you may have done that the, um, uh, the the people that fought in the actual war was only three to five percent of the people, mm -hmm. and of that three to five percent, five percent were African Americans. Now it only makes sense that uh, uh, during slavery time that some of these men were fighting for the landowners and the slave owners. And uh, when the war was over, Washington made sure that each town gave these men some land, their freedom, and provisions like any other veterans. You know, so what it boils down to, over time, it all uh, uh, evolved into the town owning the lands. And is that how it would go, even though they would... Uh, kind of bequeath these land to the soldiers that, that fought, it was still technically the town that owned the property? Well, actually, the, the, they waited, like they do now, they wait until the people who know the real story die off. You follow what I'm saying? I, I think I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah, they die off. Or if you do not write in the history books, of course, all you have to do is sit on the line, sidelines and wait for the people who witnesses to die off. and you got one story. It, it, but when I'm I'm hearing the story, you know, as I said for the first time, uh, it seems to me though that it's probably representative of something that happened in a lot of areas and a lot of communities, where you know these uh, African American soldiers, these freed slaves who defended the country, were given an honorarium, but then eventually shuffled away from the history books. Yeah, it, it, you got it. <laughs> I, yeah, and, and only time this comes up uh, is once a year. You know, we have the uh, shortest month of the year. We have the Black History, and because um, we we have icons of uh, the founding fathers, you can't shake them any more than you can shake the uh, office of the president. You know, mm -hmm. get in trouble. <laughs> and uh, a lot of politics took place uh, over the generations on how they, they got that land because it ain't just Plymouth. There's uh, uh, Kingston's involved, and in fact, I'm in Rhode Island, and uh, the Newport Tower has a, a great history ties into this uh, Portsmouth Memorial, which is dedicated to Black Patriots. Well, now the whole nation doesn't need to have a memorial. This is it's only hidden here in Rhode Island. I, I just I, I don't understand why uh, when. You know, these, it's not like these men were, you know, s still enslaved at the time that they, they, they served and that they were kind of being forced to serve. I mean, these are, are gentlemen who did not have to do this. Uh, they enlisted to defend this country, a country that the whole reason they were here was <laughs> because they were forced to be here originally. Yet they wanted, they, they love the idea of this country enough to fight. And I can't understand why that isn't being honored. 
Well, that's the whole problem. This is what began the whole story about parting ways. At the time, um, I was busy doing uh, activism uh, in, with the youth and so forth when I first heard about it. And when they took me up there, I only had Christmas addicts, the Boston Massacre, you know, the basic stuff. Mm -hmm. And to tell me after uh, going to the Mia Mia March, uh, and knowing most of the people that were organized this big event, and none of them knew anything about this history, just blew me away. All right? So when I went out to Plymouth, here we are in the middle of the woods, <laughs> and we find these graves. And there's not four graves, there's five. Okay? Now, we do a little bit of research, and we find out from the library there's four file cabinets of virgin documents, such as birth records, deeds, et cetera, et cetera, um, that were hidden uh, in the library by the library people who just resigned at that particular time. And she said there was bundles that were thrown away of African-American and Native American history. There was tons of stuff thrown away. And this was the last remnants before she retired. She hung on to it. And she kept these file cabinets right in her booth, you know, her little uh, compartment where she worked in the library. So now I wondered how come these archives weren't documented and, you know, put in for public view, you know, for research. Mm -hmm. Well, when we finally got the drawers open, because they had been closed for a long time, we looked at these things have never been touched. It, I mean, if you pull the paper, it's brittle. It's all handwritten documents. <clears throat> so, of course, that's going to lead you to dig and research more. So the more digging we did, we found out there was a specific reason why they didn't want the black founding fathers or the black veterans in the history of America's foundation because it tied in with the slave issue. Because there would be no wealth, there would be no... I mean, it took uh, 30 acres of, of uh, hemp just to provide the rope for one ship. Now, who's picking all that hemp? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a lot of labor involved. And when you talk about the Wapanogs and the Cape Verdeans and so forth that have been living there, we're going back to 1100, not 1492 and not 1620. 1100, okay? Mm -hmm. So this history, it, like the Wapanogs and the Narragansetts and so forth, has been suppressed because it's talking about the people who were native to the land when these Europeans arrived. You, you follow? Uh, absolutely. Okay, now, we basically know a little bit about it these days. But what we don't know is the occult side. It was an occult side. You know, the, the burning witches and, and the, the uh, protesters uh, from, uh, that came here called Protestants and pilgrims and so on, they all had their own religious beliefs, and they were looking for freedom, too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, the same reason why anybody, like the Egyptians, they fighting for freedom. They're not fighting because they had to fight. You give me a gun and I, I, I'm a slave. I'm running away. These guys were fighting for freedom and the promise of some land, an opportunity. And this goes way back. So anyway, uh, just to get back on the part in ways land, there was too many mysteries, too many uh, uh, cover-ups, and the curators of the museums and the Plymouth Plantation didn't want to bring this history out. And it took uh, years for me to finally get to the point where the Sons of the American Revolution accepted the idea that we weren't going to give up on this story. So they collaborated with us, and they recognized it, and we're working with them now. So um, long story short, uh, once the Sons of the American Revolution uh, recognized and, and gave due honors and, and respect to that site, they also had a ceremony which was never seen before in public uh, at the New Bedford Whaling Museum in 2006 on Patriots Day. At that time, uh, they reinstated W.E. Du Bois, who was a, uh, one of the first African Americans in the um, SARS organization. They also reinstated 
all 5,000, an estimated 5,000 uh, veterans who fought so that they would be eligible uh, to be members of SARS. Now, SARS is not just the descendants of the, or the bloodline of these uh, revolutionary founding fathers. They were also the bloodlines of um, aristocrats from Europe and England. Mm-hmm. And they were in, very deeply involved with the Masonic uh, uh, Templars, Knights, uh, Knights of Christ, uh, all the way to John D. And this is where Cape Verdean's oral history kicks in. All right, um, they have an oral history which is a Portuguese African dialect called Creole, mm-hmm. and they sing musical songs that have ancient uh, uh, vibrations in the drums, the beats, uh, the sounds, the symbols, you know, and so on. And it kept bringing back uh, this museum that's located in Plymouth where the articles they were shown, they kept ringing a bell to me because they, they were vases, the same kind of vases you see at the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know. And they were calling it Tomaran Johns that came from the uh, Caribbean area, which ain't true, you know what I mean? So when we went to the uh, curators of the museum, the Plymouth Plantation, uh, you name it, historical society, Nobody had information, and the ones that did, didn't want to give it up. And we're talking about learning institutions like UMass Boston, Dartmouth, wow. Brown University, and so on. Now, they've been holding on to these artifacts and this uh, information and had a couple of digs. Each time they have a dig, they're keeping this information and putting it aside. Because you can't do the parting way story or the story of these black patriots without rewriting the entire history of the founding of this country, which discloses a Masonic occult founding. Hmm. Now, this sounds like uh, something that we've discussed with other people off the air. The, <laughs> and uh, we, I, actually, in full disclosure, uh, I'm I'm actually standing next to a, a Mason now, and uh, Matt Moniz uh, has been a member for a few years now, and I try to get the secrets out of him, and I can't, and I know well, he knows them. Well, that's that's the whole thing. These days, and I'm sure you'll have to agree with me, um, the Masonics are anxious to get uh, information and to uh, uh, bring new life and new blood into their lodges. Uh, because the jig is up. You know, they know that the history has to be recovered and rewritten, that our icons weren't, uh, you know, gods. And, and <laughs> you know, they were humans, and they had, uh, you know, they had another side. But most importantly, <clears throat> how it ties in is the denying these veterans, because this is what Parting Ways is all about, denying these veterans these founding fathers who evidently fought side by side with Indians, blacks, even women during the revolution, before the revolution, and working under Washington were given sovereignty as a citizen in this new nation. That can't be taken away. That's why the land is under the control of the Department of Interior. Okay? Now, When I uh, got the book on um, the Department of Interior puts out on African uh, information, it had nothing about the slave trade when it came to the Cape Verdean Islands. In fact, even the maps excluded the islands. It excluded the words, excluded the culture, etc. And this is the most important part. Cape Verde is where the slave trade began. Really? Yes. A lot of people think that the slave trade, as they call it, uh, started when Columbus come over here and, you know, and, uh, took the land, now they needed blacks. But it's the other way around, okay? First off, they weren't doing no trade. It was a kidnapping. And that didn't take place until after they had killed off many tribes, the uh, uh, Arawak, 
the Wapen arm, the Batuk. The Batuk especially were taken to, the women were taken to uh, Cape Verde for a hybrid experiment to create a, uh, a brown skin uh, hybrid of their own that they could trust so they could turn their back and let them do their labor. And they had to teach these Cape Verdeans uh, as their own children. All right, how to navigate ships, how to control the uh, slave products and services that they had to provide. You know, uh, like anybody, they got a little money, they're going to pay people to do the work. Why not get a son or a daughter? <laughs> mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So they they were, uh, even up until, the, say, the 70s, Cape Verdean people actually had on their birth certificate that they were Caucasian. And they were treated entirely different from the African American. They, they believed that, like the uh, British African uh, immigrants, believe that they're British. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, I know what you mean. Uh, especially if you, you're Portuguese, you know the Knights uh, Templar or the, or the Knights of Christ uh, from the Portuguese castle of Tamor. These were the Sinclair tribes. Well, Are you familiar with them? Yeah, well, I've, I've heard of them in, in some of the literature that I've read on the Templars. Well, they built the Newport Tower. In fact, uh, this winter solace, it was a lunar eclipse that took place uh, at 10-something the night before the Venus alignment. And some of the, uh, in fact, I can uh, tell you the name of the person. He's the editor of the uh, Masonic uh, Lodge in East Providence. Uh, he does the paper or something, and he's uh, uh, the one that gave the tour to the so-called initiates, <laughs> because who else would be out there at that time in the morning <laughs> in the freezing snow? <laughs> gave the tour to the initiates when we arrived. Now, because of my um, shamanistic skills, you might say, <laughs> uh, I catch these ceremonies during their uh, alignment and astrological uh, rituals and so forth. I've been catching them as an invited guest, and they have to accept. Do you ever hear the widow's son? No. Well, your boy's right there. Ask him if you ever heard a widow's son. I, I am familiar with what you were referencing. Well, you're being quiet, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> he might be under orders to be quiet. <laughs> well, you, you swear, no. I mean, there's nothing devious behind this. No. A cow doesn't mean bad. It just no. means hidden, secret, you know, something they keep sacred to themselves. But the idea that uh, you're keeping the labor, the sacrifices, the deeds, and all these things that were uh, heritage for the African Americans that live you know, in this country today, and to look at the... the uh, uh, how you say it? these stats say that you have to have a two point something to be sustainable as a race, mm-hmm. and here we had one point six, and they kill off one hundred fifty thousand a day. You know, at the uh, um, birth control centers and planning. all this is going on in our community. Why to keep a story quiet? To keep the, the history, uh, you know, keep these icons looking like gods. You follow where I'm coming from? No, I definitely do. So parting ways has been suppressed because of this. Because you can't, just like the Indian, you cannot tell the true story without destroying the lying story. Yeah, well, the, the mythology that they've built up. Okay, we'll call it mythology. <laughs> but, it, but part of that, though, is, you know, that... Uh, you know, so often when it comes to telling the true story of history... History is just told by whoever wrote the story at the time, and that's kind of why it's his story, because he's, he's the one that wrote it. He's the one that told it. And for the, the mindset that they had at the time when they were recording all this information, you know, it, it took 200 years after these gentlemen were given this land before even that mindset began to even remotely be wiped away. Okay, but when we're in the 21st century. The race is over. Mm-hmm. We're here the race, all right? Now, as Americans, don't you think we should revisit this little problem? This we should discuss. This, this should be on the table somewhere where these soldiers could be recognized. Absolutely. Well, 
what is stopping it if you don't think there's something uh, big? <laughs> if it's not a conspiracy, what is stopping congressmen, senators, and veterans organizations for 70, I mean, well, we're talking, uh, I got involved, the history goes back to 72. Our charter goes back to 1972. What is in fact, the people that were back there in 72 weren't famous. They were called Dick Gregory, but nobody knew him. Spike Lee, but nobody knew him. Uh, I can name a few other great leaders. Jesse Jackson. They all knew about this. But when they got the land and were supposed to build a museum, entities, so to speak, sidetracked them with success. Mm-hmm. And they kind of forgot about the mission. And this kept happening for 30-something years, okay? Now, only uh, me and this brother, who's the president now, uh, we're two veterans who are trying to get this story told, uh, have been working on it for the past 10 years. And no matter where we turn, no matter black governor, no matter what race you are or nothing, this is a story that, for some reason, denies these veterans of the recognition and their descendant, the heritage of that recognition. And, and that's what's the most amazing about this story is that I, I looked up some of the information in your history on, on partingways.org, and for 30 years now, over 30 years, it's been recognized on the National Register of Historic Places. And you would think that that alone would get the ball rolling to have some sort of museum built there. And reading Jack Splain's column, you see how many different legislators and how many different governors and senators and whoever this has been brought up before, it seems like everybody kind of gives you that initial <laughs> promise to help. Well, they, I believe they have good intent. Mm-hmm. But you've got to look at the, um, let's say, the legal side. And I can act name names now because uh, uh, God bless them, he passed. Uh, Kennedy uh, stopped this thing back in the 70s basically because the the African Americans during that time were treated with deliberate indifference. And the Cape Verdeans were like the only mediators between the races at that time. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to build the nuclear power plant up there. Now, the old man that kept this history alive, Andre's family, he just died the other day. Uh, He's five generations. They actually, his children worked in the dig and everything. Um, the point is that they were uh, discredited, they lost their jobs, they actually took a case all the way to uh, the Supreme Court and fought it himself, and, and vir- virtually won it, but the, the compensation thing changed with the politicians. You follow what I'm saying? Yep. All right. So in, in, in the history behind it, where Bechtel, now remember, Bechtel back then was building these nuclear plants and so on. Uh, and this ties to the same people that spilled this stuff up the Gulf, <laughs> you know, in the underground digging, they're doing and, and these secret sites and so forth. These are the same people. Um, they've taken the native lands and the uh, people's culture and their, their, their whole background and heritage, and they've industrialized and commercialized it for profit which is normal for, you know, today. We understand that commercialism, you know, uh, mm-hmm. it's a it's, it's necessary, a necessary evil, I guess you could yeah, say. Yeah, necessary. But where were the percentage, the, the 5% of, of, of African-American jobs? Where were, in fact, Plymouth Plantation refuses to recognize party ways as a part of uh, Plymouth history. Now, why is that? No, that, that, I mean, that to me, that's the most inexcusable part. It's one thing to have these politicians that are happy to shake your hand and promise you to look into funding and then not deliver. We've kind of come to expect that uh, from politicians. <laughs> but when you have an organization whose sole purpose it is, is to uh, you know, perpetuate the history of the Plymouth Colony, you can't yeah. ignore part of the Plymouth Colony. But it's, it's one thing to say what is right and moral. But if it's not being in practice, it's just talk, and this is what's been happening. These have these politicians and, and people have 
uh, good intent when they start. But somewhere up the chain, someone says, squash it. I haven't seen in the past 11 years one dime donated towards this effort. And the ones that do support it, such as the Sons of the American Revolution and um, uh, the, the Daughters of uh, Dar and all these uh, veterans organizations that have been involved, they just invite us so that they can appear as though blacks are now being involved. Well, you say that you haven't seen a dime of donations. You mean from the government and from, from these organizations? Any organization, from any, any, I'm saying any. And we're a nonprofit since 1972. But you, you, you must have some private individuals who are putting up donations. Most of the individuals that are involved that are putting up anything is coming out of their park are the members of Parting Ways. So that should show these other organizations that there is. You know, people who are supporting this, who are passionate about this. You know what it boils down to? We, we know what everything boils down to. Group, a group like Plymouth Plantation or some of these legislators, they look at it and they say, you know, it's a nice idea. And when we need the PR move, we can do it. But for now, we look at it, and it's not really going to be a sustainable economic thing for us to invest the money in. If we thought we were going to start getting $20 a ticket to have people go through there like they do at Plymouth Plantation, it would be a different story. And that, that's, you know how well, it works. No, no, I, I beg to disagree with you on that. You don't. You don't. Oh no! They'll, I'll give you an example. The the one memorial that's dedicated to the Black Patriots in this country is located in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have a black population up there, but it's way out. Okay, and it's the middle of two highways. Okay, uh, there's no structures around it for you to really park or to sit or anything like that. But it's built. So, uh, Geo Metch, it's on ley line. It has a uh, square door where you could walk through a uh, portal. On one side, it has the start, the other side has the image of the black. It's a beautiful, beautiful memorial, but nobody goes there. No, no school buses, <laughs> no kids know about it, except for what we put out there. It's not promoted, not even by the ones who will support us at events, and these events, because it's usually televised or it's public and it's political, and, and they look good. So, you know, we kind of use each other, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. But as far as money, you put your money where your mouth is. And I can hold in my hand five fingers and tell you one of those fingers ain't fan. These are the members. Okay. Okay. The, it, the board, that would be the basically. thumb, right? Excuse me. <laughs> that would be the thumb, right? <laughs> it seems like that. It yeah. seems like that. But you're talking about guys that have been dying off trying to sell this story, who have been ruining their personal and family fortunes, trying to to get this thing out there, and they're not professionals. Professionals take it, get your grant to store it somewhere, and archive it, and and just get the money every year, get another grant, put a little paper out on it, to, you know, and just keep it in the, the, the university. Well, th it seems like this museum, you know, aside from recognizing uh, these individuals, and we, and we should let people know who they were, Plato Turner, Cato Howe, Prince Goodwin, and Kwame Quash. Uh, and there's a fifth grade. And the fifth grade, has, uh, the fifth grade hasn't been determined with a name? Is that... Well, the, the, this is the controversy. Now, my research tells me that they're not even the graves. Okay. Just markers that were put on that land? My research tells me that that land was very important. In fact, every bit of the land that was given by this uh, proclamation that Washington told the, the towns to do were specifically... Um, uh, back in those days, they, they, they put them on ley lines. They call them energy lines, whatever, mm -hmm. geometric lines. And it supposedly it, it generates good energy, okay? They build their churches, they build their, you know, temples, they cast on these lines. Well, that land happens to line up with some very significant sites. 
okay? And we're talking about the Newport Tower, the Kensington Room, Stone, Stone Inn. These things are lining up for a reason. In the temples, in these uh, researchers today are finding out they also uh, align to the stars and astrology and things like that. Now, what do they know that they would want to just wipe out an entire group of people from the history books? Who got that land? For example, the first thing built on that land was a road that divided. Okay? Then later on, they put a school a Catholic school, mm -hmm. okay? Now, where did they get permission? Because the Department of Interior didn't give it to them. You wouldn't build on a cemetery or another historical site, would you? You're talking building the school. Building a private school. A religious one at that, you know. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh -huh. private, a parochial school. And, and for those who are, are familiar with the area, we're talking about, this is on Route 80 in Plymouth. Right. Uh, we're right talking about the Sacred Route. Heart High School. Right. And uh, I can tell you, I've gone down that road many, many times uh, over the years because uh, it was kind of my back way to a lot of things. And I never realized that, that Parting Ways was even there. Oh, there's, there's a lot more to this land deal, trust me. Uh, in fact, they was getting ready to, when I came in the picture, they were getting ready to build a crematorium across the road from the cemetery. And um, when you look at the what the condition the site was in, I, uh, you couldn't find it. You had to push bushes like a uh, outback. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? To get into the site, there was no parking. You had to park on the side of the road uh, on an angle because there was no parking space. We made them put a sign, and they put a little small 10 by 20 sign. Uh, so we built one, and they, uh, I built it personally put a big white sign there so people could see it, made them put a parking lot or clear the land. And we, we did a few other little beautifications up there. And we started doing ceremonies and rituals at events like Thanksgiving and so on, et cetera. But as far as getting support, from, in fact, they even closed the museum where they have the artifacts that are part of ways, uh, you know, uh, exhibits are. They closed it. You could look in the window and see it. Mm -hmm. And it's been closed. So now the, the question is, the way they're treating this, as though there is a deliberate attempt to keep this quiet. Now, I would like to know why, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Well, then what happens? And I'll tell you another thing. I've gone to many, many organizations in three or four states. I'm a tri-stater. And uh, I've been to many, many organizations that's supposed to help and represent blacks. And when they first hear the story, they're all excited and enthusiastic to work with it. And when it comes down to the nitty gritty, they won't even return your phone calls. Now, what happened? Even the Tuskegee Institute? Oh, definitely. Uh, this uh, Rhode Island Airmen's thing, they got radio shows. I talked to all of them guys. And they'll talk to me, yeah, 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 yeah. I had to put my own TV on show on because they wouldn't even invite me or call me back. There's more to it, trust me. I mean, you're talking about um, write, rewriting history, number one. And there's millions of dollars in textbooks, curriculum, and so forth. All right? Text, now, textbooks that aren't telling the whole story, by the way. Huh? Textbooks that aren't telling the whole story, by the way. They are deliberately not telling the whole story. It's deliberate. Well, I mean, it, but if it's not going to be paid for by any of these organizations, if they're not going to get behind it and support it, then it has to be grassroots. It has to be the individuals exactly. who make it happen. Exactly. Well, this is what we've been doing. We've been doing grassroots. In fact, uh, we made it clear that the intent that these uh, soldiers, if in fact the land was given to them for that purpose, should be farming, agriculture, and, and, and you know, a lifestyle uh, that was intended for their children. So our, I don't know if you saw on the website, we have a uh, vision of what we want to do on the land. Mm -hmm. We want to have a couple of acres of just pure organic foods, and we want to have windmills and solar panels on a conference center. So instead of these organizations going to 
uh, Ramada in and hauled in and paying a fortune for a conference or an event, they could have it on this land. People, instead of going to parks, they can go to this beautifully landscaped place. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. Even fish farms. You know what I mean? Because I know food is going to be an issue for us. Well, I know that if uh, if enough you know, people get behind this vision and enough people support it, I've seen things happen grassroots style. I've seen things happen in spite of something trying to hold it down. And I, I think that this is something that once more people become aware of it, you'll see that happen. How can people, because uh, we are up against the, uh, the end of the show here, how can people get involved if they want to, if they want to make a donation, if they want to get involved with the organization, do whatever they can to help? Well, again, they can contact us through the website, or I could give you uh, an address. Or, but like I said, this, it, it, all the information's out there. Mm -hmm. We're a nonprofit. Um, not that we're looking for federal handouts and dictation and all that stuff. But uh, any dime, 10 cents, it just makes you feel good. You know, somebody oh, can. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I recently got a donation as far away as Florida. And it came at a time. Because we give our DVDs away free. We go out to events and, and uh, out in front of schools and so forth, especially this month, and give away thousands of DVDs with this history on it. Okay? Now, that comes out of two people's pockets. Okay? So if I can do that, well, one more person might be able to do double that. Mm -hmm. And one more person might be able to double that. I'm on a fixed income. I'm a, I'm a great granddaddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations on that. <laughs> you know, I was a single father for 20 some odd years with 13 kids. Whoa. You know, I mean, it's all up a matter of Google. Google it out. So mm -hmm. when I offer my services to help young men and women uh, um, come up, create jobs and stuff like that, I'm looking at land as a development project as well as a memorial. Yeah, well, I mean, I think if if you can touch that younger generation as you are doing with, you know, get, getting these DVDs out there, it seems like they're willing to embrace the fact that, you know, history hasn't been told correctly. It seems, the more young people that I talk to, the more they realize, maybe even the teachers who are of my generation are telling them, listen, you know, this isn't the whole story. Even though it's not in the book, I'm going to tell you about, you know, what happened over here. And I think as we're seeing more of those young people, and they... In, in, uh, again, we're up against the end of the clock. We could talk with you about this whole other time, but I know that you're involved in a lot of causes with today's youth, and you see the fact that they need something to kind of rally around. Well, there, there's no leaders. Mm -hmm. there, there, we actually have a generation, and you can't name me one leader. E even those who are leading. You can't call them leaders. Yeah, because nobody's following. Know who they are. Yeah. <laughs> what have they done? Since the yeah. 60s, 70s, what are these folks so but represent us? Whenever you need a, a, a African American to speak, that's who they are. Yep. No, I, I know. And, I, and like I said, this is something we could talk about on a whole, a whole different episode. Uh, but we, like I said, we are up against the end of the show. So we'll we'll tell people though that partingways.org is the website where you can find all the information. Out. I know there's some issues with the contact email on there. When I sent an email to it, it got bounced back to me. But you guys are on Facebook. Well, you know, I'll tell you something. Um, the website of partingways.org uh, has a webmaster technicality. <laughs> We're not experts. So you're looking, you're looking uh, for somebody can, that can donate some time to help you out and be a webmaster. Well, that's what we're doing now, uh, reaching out now. Because I'll tell you, uh, up until 2011, we weren't looking for money. I know that sounds weird, huh? We were looking to get this information out. That was the mission. Now we've accomplished that goal. We know there's enough people out there mathematically through deductive reasoning that this information is going to just keep rolling, perpetual motion. You can't keep secrets once you let it out. It's on its own. It takes a life of its own. All right? So now you see it on the History Channel. Now you see it on the uh, Discovery Channel. Now you're hearing it about it on the uh, videos and, and the rappers are talking about it. Well, this 10 years ago, they weren't. 
I hate to cut you off, but we are we are we have reached the end point. Hey, I thank you for hey. calling and giving me a chance to talk about. Thank Biden. you, and and be sure to send us updates with what's going on. I certainly will. Remember, if you want good information, go to kateverdian.net. Absolutely. kateverdian.net, and then Parting Ways is partingways.org. .org. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck with everything, and uh, like I said, stay in touch, please. All right. And you just have a good night. You too. All right. We are, uh, we're up against the end of the show, but uh, be sure to join us next week. Stanton Friedman and Kathy Martin will be joining us to talk about their new book, Science is Wrong. So until then, stay spooktacular. Talk and sports. This is WBSM New Bedford, Citadel Broadcasting, AM 1420, WBSM. From ABC News, I'm Hillary Barsky. In Egypt, it's still up in the air when the military will be taking the transition to hand over power to an elected government. ABC's Christiane Amanpour reports from Cairo. From the beginning, they said that the people's uh, grievances were legitimate. And even when they took formal power of the country, they did also say that uh, military power is no substitute for the people's wishes. So they're saying the right thing. The real test is going to be when they lift emergency law, when they have an actual roadmap. You remember Mubarak had said there'd be elections latest September. September. The military hasn't even said that. Texas Congressman Ron Paul won the presidential straw poll at the annual Conservative Political Action Conference in Washington on Saturday, receiving 30 percent of the vote. However, that doesn't mean that his win will translate to the GOP's nominee for the White House in 2012. ABC's Taman Bradley. These things are a small sampling. It depends on who can energize their supporters. Mitt Romney, for example, won CPAC a couple of years ago during the presidential contest.